Sometimes, what was thought to be a unique form of dinosaur has instead turned out to be a juvenile form of a larger species. Examples include Draco Rex and Stygi Almac, who were actually immature Pachycephalosaurus, and Nano Tyrannus, who was a misclassified juvenile Tyrannosaurus Rex. At first, a new commentary by paleontologist Dr. Andrea Cow, titled Comments on the Mesozoic Theropod Dinosaurs from Italy, would seem to suggest something less extreme. He concluded the Italian consignated Shippy Onyx may actually be a very young Cacarodontosaurid. Shippy Onyx was already known to be a juvenile, and since it was the first dinosaur found in Italy, it is unlikely it will end up as a junior synonym of a previously named species. However, the paper has larger implications, which could mean some other consignathids are also the misclassified juvenile forms of larger species of theropod and at the most extreme, could mean the entirety of Comsignathidae is an invalid clade. Before going any further, it should be noted that Dr. Cow's paper is new, and it will take more time and much more research to see if his hypothesis holds any weight. Even if every point in his paper is correct, it is far from enough to render Comsignathidae invalid. Rather, the paper brings up points that suggest the matter requires further investigation. First, here is a recap of what Comsignathidae is. Comsignathidae is a clade of small, carnivorous theropods that is part of the larger clade, Solorosaura. Solorosaura includes birds as well as many bird-like dinosaurs, with Comsignathids being one of the earliest diverging branches. While some Solorosaurs would later grow to become giants, all Comsignathids were small. The meter-long Comsignathus was famous for being the smallest known dinosaur for nearly a century. Only one Compsognathid, Cenocalyopteryx, is known to have exceeded a length of 2 meters. Other Compsognathids include Aristosuchus, Miriishka, and Cenosauropteryx, the first non-avian dinosaur preserved with unambiguous feathers and one of the few dinosaurs whose basic coloration is known. While Compsognathids had an unspecialized anatomy with few unique features, they were the most famous small theropods before the Dromaeosaurids rose to fame, in part because Compsognathus was one of the first largely complete dinosaurs found. However, many Compsognathid features are also similar to those of the very limited remains of the juveniles of the contemporary, large, non-solorosaurin theropods. This has made it difficult to classify some species of theropod, such as Shuromimus. The only known Shuromimus specimen was very young, perhaps just a few months old when it died. When it was first found, it was classified as a young Megalosauroid, part of Carnosaura, which made up most of the large carnivores during the late Jurassic period. Since its discovery, Shuromimus has been shuffled around Theropoda quite a bit, but usually has been found to be a Compsognathid or another basal Solorosaur. The most recent analysis, by Dr. Christian Foth and his co-authors once again found Shuromimus to most likely be a megalosauroid. The same paper also found Jurovenator to also be a megalosauroid. Like Shuromimus, Jurovenator is another feathered theropod only known from a single, immature skeleton and was also classified as a compsognathid. However, while a megalosauroid classification for the two was found to be the most likely option, the evidence in favor of this conclusion still wasn't that much stronger than the other options. This brings us to Dr. Cow's paper. While Dr. Foth and his co-authors assumed the classification of the other compsognathids was valid, some paleontologists, including Dr. Cow, have suspected some or all of the other species and compsognathidae may instead be juveniles of larger species, throwing off the results. He examined another theropod that has been classified as a compsognathid, Scipionyx, a theropod from early Cretaceous Italy famous for its preservation of soft tissue. Like Shuromimus and Jurovenator, Scipionyx is only known from a single juvenile specimen, probably a hatchling. Dr. Cow compared the jaws of Scipionyx and a young Allosaurus, one of the few definitive fossils of the offspring of a large theropod, and the only such fossil that has been studied in detail. He found numerous similarities between them, though still found some differences. However, every single one of these is also a difference between Allosaurus and the members of Cacarodontosauridae, a derived branch of Carosaura and one which Allosaurus was closely related to. 
If you were to take the young Allosaurus skull and added a few Kakarodontosaurus traits, you would basically have Skippy Onyx's jaw. Only two traits were present in the Skippy Onyx jaw, but not also in the Kakarodontosaurids. However, these traits were also present in the young Allosaurus, but absent in the adult form. Dr. Cow also found other Carnosaurian traits in the rest of Skippy Onyx's skeleton. Overall, this makes for a fairly strong case that Skippy Onyx was not a young Compsognathid, but instead a Cacarodontosaurid hatchling. Dr. Cow also found evidence that cast doubt on the plausibility of Skippy Onyx even being able to be a hatchling of a dinosaur as small as a Compsognathid. The only known Shipionic specimen wasn't very old, and the reconstruction of its egg is simply too large to have been laid by any known Compsognathid. In contrast, Shipionics was almost the exact same size as the Allosaurus chick. So, if Dr. Cow is correct, why was it found to be a Compsognathid in previous papers? He suggested it was because juvenile specimens have been included in phylogenetic analyses the software is not suited for. Young dinosaurs were not many versions of the adults, often differing substantially from them. Differences from the adult form could easily lead to the software misclassifying them as separate species. Additionally, since many features important for identifying evolutionary lineages only appear in adulthood, the software may not place juveniles in the proper clade. Therefore, when immature specimens are placed in such analyses, their juvenile status must be taken into account. Even when this is done, including many juvenile specimens and a phylogenetic analysis can mess up the results, grouping distantly related juveniles together based on features related to their immaturity rather than their evolutionary relationships. This is what Dr. Cow suspected happened to Shiromimus, Shippy Onyx, and Girovanator. All three are only known from young specimens. Worse, Many other consignathids are only known from what are unambiguously juveniles. To correct this, Dr. Cow proposed a new method to filter traits associated with immaturity in juvenile specimens. He then placed Shippy Onyx, Shuromimus, and Juravenator in two different phylogenetic analyses. In one, he didn't filter their juvenile features, and in the second, he did. In the first, they were all grouped together as part of Compsignathidae but in the second, Shippy Onyx was placed in Cacarodontosauridae, while Shuromimus and Girovanator were placed in Megalosauroidae. A few chicks of large predators being misclassified as compsognathids is one thing, but the paper contains a more radical hypothesis. That what was thought to be the compsognathid body plan is actually the juvenile form of basal tetaneurans. Tetaneura includes two major groups, Carnosaura and Solorosaura. Most members of Carnosaura were large predators, including the Allosauroids, such as the Cacarodontosaurids, and possibly the Megaraptorans, and the Megalosauroids, which include the Spinosaurids. Most of the Solorosaurs that coexisted with the Compsognathids were generally small, but there were a few large species like Eutyrannus. It should be noted that Dr. Cow did not extend his hypothesis to the more bird-like Manuraptorans whose juveniles are thought to have diverged from the Compsognathid-like body plan. So, what would be the status of Compsognathidae? As mentioned before, Dr. Cal suggests it could be a completely invalid collection of juvenile tetaneurans. Alternatively, Compsognathidae may be valid, only with some of the species currently placed in it being misclassified. Dr. Cal suggested this may be because Compsognathidae was pediomorphic having retained some of the juvenile characteristics of their ancestors into adulthood, leading to juvenile theropods accidentally being grouped with them. Either way, most of the species assigned to Compsognathidae would still be valid, their adult form merely being very different from our current image of them. So, besides the three taxa discussed in the paper, what evidence does Dr. Cow give for the other Compsognathids being misclassified? First, Compsognathids had a fairly unspecialized body plan, which would make sense if they were merely chicks of the various larger species. They also lacked the sexually selected features seen in most other theropods like horns, crest, or unusual feathers. The only exception is a species of Compsognathid from Brazil, which is technically unnamed since the paper that described it was retracted for ethical violations. This Compsognathid had long feathers on its shoulders, 
likely to attract mates, heavily suggesting it was an adult. Second, very few fossils have been identified as belonging to the chicks of the large basal tetanurans. Almost all of their fossils belong to either adults or juveniles who are much larger than the species assigned to Compsognathidae. Meanwhile, many Compsognathids are only known from what are unambiguously juveniles, and they are the exact right size and proportions to be the missing juveniles of the larger tetanurans. Third, at least some Compsognathids actually being the chicks of large carnivores would solve a long-standing mystery. Dinosaurs were our selected species, those who had many small eggs and hatchlings, of which only a few made it to adulthood. This is opposed to the strategy of K-selected species, who invest heavily into a few offspring. This means the majority of dinosaurs alive at any one time, and the majority who died, were juveniles. In the words of paleontologist Thomas R. Holtz Jr., given the reproductive strategy and life history of dinosaurs, your assumption when you find a dino fossil is that it is not an adult without additional evidence. Therefore, fossils of the small juveniles of larger predatory dinosaurs should be well represented in the fossil record compared to those of adults. However, as mentioned earlier, such fossils are extremely rare and incomplete. Part of this may be due to preservation bias. The bones of larger individuals are more likely to last long enough to be fossilized and withstand geological forces that would crush smaller ones. However, the relative abundance of compsognathids makes this seem unlikely. Since they are the same size, it would be expected if they were fossilized, so would the chicks of the larger carnivores. Some of these compsognathids actually being those offspring neatly solves this mystery. Finally, Compsognathid fossils are found in the exact same time periods as the basal tetanurans. If some Compsognathids were actually the juveniles of larger theropods like carnosaurs, this has some interesting ecological implications. Recent years have found there is a gap between the smaller theropods and the large size apex predators. The niche of medium sized predator was instead usually filled by the adolescents of the larger theropods. If Dr. Cow is correct, there were less adult predatory dinosaurs during the late Jurassic and early Cretaceous than once thought. Instead, the chicks filled this niche, just as they would later go on to fill the niches of medium size and then apex predator. It still should be remembered that even if Compsognathidae as a whole is invalid, there were still other small, carnivorous theropods during this time, as well as other small carnivores like terrestrial crocodiliomorphs. Dr. Cow's paper also has significant implications on the debate of which dinosaurs had feathers. Shiromimus and Juravenator both had feathers. Shiromimus' tail was so fluffy, its name means squirrel mimic. If they were megalosauroids, then feathers weren't just present in Solorosaura, strengthening the case that they were ancestral to Dinosauria. Of course, this wouldn't necessarily mean adults were as fluffy as their fossilized chicks as larger species have less feathers or fur than smaller ones. In the case of large theropods, it would make sense for them to lose some or all of their feathers as they aged. Smaller species, and those that lived in cooler climates, may have retained them, as was the case in the large Solorosaur, Eutyrannus. Some feathers may have also been retained for display. Bumps have been found on the arms of the Carnosaur concave venator, which some paleontologists think may have been quill knobs, attachment points for large feathers. Still, scales have been found on its tail, so it was not as fluffy as Shuromimus. Finally, it is important to understand that this paper is far from the last word on the matter. It is only a new hypothesis, not a fact. While the paper may make a compelling case that Shippy Onyx, Shuromimus, and Juravenator were carnosaur chicks, there has not been enough time to see if Dr. Cow's findings will be accepted by the rest of the scientific community. His method of filtering for juvenile characteristics could be erroneous. While the evidence he gives for some or all compsognathids being the misclassified juveniles of large predators is interesting, his paper only tested the status of three controversial taxa. Much more research will need to be done to test his hypothesis, and even more before it can possibly replace the current classification for compsognathids. For now, rather than forming strong opinions on the matter, it is better to remain cautious and to wait and see what further research brings. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something interesting. Have a great day, and if you enjoyed the video, 
Please remember to hit the like button.